Hey everyone, today we're talking about Rubik's Cubes. I think that they're pretty cool, and I don't just say that because they're kind of a world-renowned puzzle, but more so that I actually just really like the mechanics of them. However, I unfortunately don't own a Rubik's Cube, or actually have any idea how to solve one, so you're just going to have to accept these player heads that I found online. But the idea of building an actual Rubik's Cube that is both usable and solvable in Minecraft has always kind of been in the back of my mind, and I will get there eventually, but it's kind of difficult. Much of these difficulties kind of arise out of the inherent mechanics of a Rubik's Cube, where it's a cube that things rotate around, and rotations are very difficult to perform in Minecraft without commands or mods like Create. And as I said, I'd eventually get to this, maybe with piston feed tapes or something, but today's about a little bit of a different approach. The approach that we intend to use today is the age-old strategy of instead of increasing the amount of effort we're putting into something, we're simply going to lower our standards. And in order to take the incredible complexity of the Rivix Cube and size it down to something we can manage just a little bit better, we'll take the very thing that makes it a cube, its three-dimensionality, and chop it down to a level that we can actually work with. So today is not really about Rubik's Cubes, but more so their second dimensional cousins, and today we'll be covering everything from that, to displaying numbers with water, to talking about some of the more forbidden ways of stacking items, and how we can utilize signal strengths that really kind of don't exist. So to start off, what actually goes into a two-dimensional Rubik's Cube? More so, how do they work and what are they made of? The three-dimensional Rubik's Cube relies on the fact that it's 3D and the fact that you can rotate certain sections with other sections to sort of scramble the thing and generate complexity. The three-dimensionality allows you to have something to rotate into. Now, unfortunately for us, despite the removed complexity of having a third dimension, our 2D Rubik's Square does not have this luxury. We don't really have anywhere to rotate into unless you want to just rotate around the center, and that's not very complex, is it? In order to actually do anything, we need to move the pieces around, and we can't just have pieces leaking outside of the square, and we can't remove a tile because then we just end up with another standard sliding block puzzle. Our only real option for 2D Rubik's Square enthusiasts is to sort of suspend our disbelief that this could maybe work in real life, and pretend there's a sort of portal on every side of the square. If we were to push this entire line that way, everything would move into the portal, the green square would end up on the other side, and everything else would get pushed forward. This simple setup keeps squares inside of our grid, fixing the leaking problem, as well as adding any level of complexity as we can move these tiles around, scramble things up, as much as we'd like, making it very, very difficult to solve. Very much in tune with the original premise of the original Rubik's Cube. And it's very probable that you know this already exists and already has a name, it was invented a long, long time ago by the legendary Carrie K.H., but luckily they don't do redstone, which means I'm still in the clear for originality. Do go check out the one they made, though, it's super well polished and you can actually play it online. Now that we've discussed the sort of context, let's talk about some actual design. The first thing we're going to be discussing is how we show the player the game, and I'm just going to be using a standard 5x5 grid layout, like Carrie KH uses, only I'm not going to be using colors, because those are super irritating to display compactly with redstone, without maps. The actual thing we're going to be using is numbers, because those happen to be very easy to work with, with a 7 segment display, and since I'm feeling very creative, we'll use some water to do it. Water, like all liquids, very conveniently takes the shape of any container that you put it into. And we can actually automate this water dumping process by simply burying waterlogged blocks underneath the ground and ejecting them upwards with pistons. These two water blocks will form a source in the center, essentially keeping this display cell alive until we decide to obstruct it by pushing up a block in the center. There's also the brief prospect of kind of punching tiny little waterlogged holes in the ground to let the water take this shape without actually having to constrict its flow with real barriers, but the highly astute of you might notice that this design is absolutely hideous, which is why we ended up going with this other cell version. If you take a bunch of these smaller cells, even if they're quite large, and add them all together to form big giant 7 segment displays, now you can actually start displaying numbers. But unfortunately for us, these really cool looking numbers aren't actually doing anything. 
They're just sitting here, and now we need to figure out a way to communicate to these tiles effectively what we want. The way we'll actually be telling these displays what we actually want to display is pretty simple. We'll just be using this little machine called a red coder, and essentially when we output a signal strength from it, like from a container that is filled to a certain level, it outputs exactly one output. As we look through these different shulker boxes, we can see the various outputs that are being displayed, and each of these torches can link up to a specific number. However, you may have noticed we have a little bit of a problem. See, the thing is, is we want to make a 5x5. Five five. That is 25 different numbers. The only problem is, is that Mojang has only allotted us signal strength of 0, this is actually 1, all the way up to 15. So where are we going to get the other 9 numbers? Luckily though, we have just the right solution. If it wasn't made pretty obvious by the giant, inconspicuous red wall behind me covering obviously a bunch of other shulker boxes with new and undiscovered signal strengths, there are a collection of far more forbidden signal strengths that we can utilize to accommodate for our extra 9 numbers. You see, what the government has been secretly hiding from you is that there's actually a way to store more than 27 unstackables in the 27 slots of a shulker box. And you can actually do this in survival, all you have to do is chuck two curse books into a grindstone, and simply just put them in. If we do the highly specialized math, we can see that 27 out of 27 items outputs 15 signal strength, whereas 28 items out of 27 items should probably be a little bit more. And thus, the overloaded comparator was born. Except I'm actually just totally screwing with you, because what I've actually done is just buried a gazillion redstone torches underneath the ground. If we go ahead and wash away these torches, we can actually see what this actually looks like. Yep, it's only reaching 15 blocks. The unfortunate reality is that even though we know that the shulker box is outputting more than 15 signal strength, this doesn't actually translate to more than 15 signal strength being translated into this redstone dust. It caps out at 15, and that's because Redstone Dust was designed with the intention that comparators really don't output more than 15 signal strength. In other words, the Redstone Dust, unable to support signal strengths higher than the maximum of 15, essentially takes the super high signal strength being outputted by the shulker box, and kind of trims it down to the same level as the normal Redstone block. And you might be saying, hey, that sucks a whole lot, why do we even care about high signal strength then? And the reason we care is because even though the red zone dust has absolutely no way of supporting signal strengths higher than 15, the comparator has no qualms about outputting insane amounts of power. And we can actually harness this by bringing it down to a level we can understand. If we inject a 17 signal strength comparator straight into a piece of redstone dust, it's going to get trimmed. But if we know that it's overloaded, we can subtract 15 from it, bring it down to a level we can actually read, and now manipulating this value actually allows us to see the results in redstone dust. In other words, since the overloaded signal strength is outside of our range of being able to detect it with redstone dust, we actually just use subtraction to take that outside range and sort of push it back into some of the range that we can actually understand and read. And if I actually come back to the shulker box display with the wall torn down, we'll see a bunch of shulker boxes that are seemingly outputting much smaller values than the stuff that we're seeing right over here, but they're actually being subtracted from by a level of 15 from this redstone block, bringing them down into the range we can understand, meaning now we have 16, 17, 18, 19, and so on. The way I actually applied this theory to something useful is by developing this sort of special red coder that's just the same normal red coder. As you can see, if I put a 4 in, we get an output of 4, but it's special because it has the capability of recognizing the fact that if we put in, for example, a overloaded box, if it outputs a full signal strength of 15, then it's going to switch the parameters to only outputting on this top level instead. Then it reads the value as per usual, only knowing that it's subtracted by 15, and outputs that. What we end up with is a slightly bulkier, more complicated version, but luckily for us it has two completely different rows of values, giving us a wider range of things to choose from. This machine comes with a tiny little bit of extra nuance though, because our value range is actually 1 to 27 instead of 1 to 25 like you might accept, except we're going to be just cutting out 14 and 15 for a very small optimization reason that you can read in the description. 
I also wanted to briefly say a massive thank you to this person on Discord who helped me in a random call, helping me wrap my head around the whole high signal strength situation with the optimization I put in the description. Okay, back to the red coder. So we've got a little machine that takes our shulker box and outputs a very specific line, but how can we actually make that line tell the display over there in the distance what to actually show? Well, the thing is, is that each display cell on its own simply just can be turned on or off. And for each numbered tile, we have two displays. Since there's seven segment displays, that's seven plus seven. So that's 14 different lines that we need to specifically tell each one whether to turn on or turn off. The process of having each shulker box lead to a specific configuration of ons and offs for every single segment is pretty simple. We just take the output of the red coder, run it down a long line, and then put an observer running into each of the 14 display interfaces in just the right spots so that each number activates the right segments. If you didn't quite get that, don't worry, here's a little bit of a demonstration. Say we want to display the number 11. I've gone ahead and marked out each segment with its own little number, and as you can see in order to display 11, we need these four segments, and these will be 3, 6, 10, and 13. If we go ahead and grab the 11 box, freeze the game now, place down our box, and then simply unfreeze the game while under here, we can see that this line specifically activates. If we go ahead and look explicitly at the observers reading this particular line, we have an observer here, here, a little bit further down, here, and here. And if we go out to the front, we'll see that these correspond to the specific numbered segments that we want. 3, 6, 10, and 13. Throwing this machine underneath the display and actually hooking up every single one of these wires to their corresponding display units, we can actually do just that. By throwing in a shulker box in the right spot, we can get this display to output exactly what we're looking for. So let's reflect on what we did. We discussed the prospects of a two-dimensional Rubik's Cube, discussed how it might work, and we also talked about how to display these numbers using water-based seven segments, as well as encoding these displays into shulker boxes that use comparator overloading to achieve all the different number varieties that we're looking for. Next episode, we'll be building the logic that governs how we actually implement 2D Rubik's Cube mechanics by driving the shulker boxes around in these little water streams that I've started to put together. If you want to be here for the next installment of this mini-series, make sure to subscribe so you'll be notified when that one comes out. In the meantime, you may as well check out the other stuff that I posted on this channel. I make a lot of other stuff that's pretty much just like this. As with all things, make sure to leave a comment if you want to see me cover something, or since this project isn't even finished yet, make sure to leave a comment giving any suggestions if you want to actually help with what the final project could look like. As with always, if you enjoyed the video, make sure to leave a like, subscribe, and I'll see you next time.